Yeah, I'm a, I'm a poor Hauso kid. So I think my fascination with property came from having nothing. You know, not own, we didn't even own a car. It was just my mother and I, no car, no money. The wealthy are getting rapidly wealthier. The price gap or the wealth gap is getting very, very big in Australia. We believe every Australian deserves a right to own at the very least five investment properties. I'm Adrian Trimboli. And I'm Frank Ambezi. And welcome to the Invest in You podcast. What the mind can conceive and believe it can achieve. Quote from Napoleon Hill. It's a great quote to, for today's topic, and it's something that, you know, if you want to achieve something, if you want to do something, you have to put your mind towards that vision, that goal, that task, whatever it may be for you to achieve it. And it relates with our, our guest today. Of course, he's done some um, really amazing things. He's done a lot of things when it comes to property fundamentals, data, and, and machine learning when it comes to analyzing property fundamentals. And, you know, he's... Uh, He's got a wealth of knowledge and this quote relates with him, but it's not just that, of course, it relates with anyone in life that has that wants to achieve anything and puts their mind to it. I believe that if you've got your mind set on a goal or target, you believe you will achieve it, you will achieve it. Uh, if you haven't read Napoleon Hill's book, Think and Grow Rich, I highly recommend it as well. So he uh, interviews some of the, you know, the wealthiest person, people in the world and the most successful people and what they done, what was their routine, what were their rituals, what were they doing to, you know, keep themselves on track. And, you know, of course, it's not going to be uh, a nice straight road, but it's going to be some ups and downs. But through those ups and downs, you're going to learn a lot of things. So let's get into it. So today's today's guest that we have on, we have Kent Lardner. Now, for you, so for you listening and um, watching and you don't know who Kent Lardner is, he's owner of Suburb Trends, which is a website which helps you re it's machine it's it's sorry it's data learning machine technology that he uses to help analyze property fundamentals so he's got a great website you know suburbtrends.com.au uh, helping you to understand property fundamentals of, lo of specific locations now he offers a whole bunch of um, tools on his website so visit his website it's got a, it's a great it's a great tool but for you don't for for his further background which I'll get him to introduce himself but he's I guess Kent was a He's got a science and a business leading background. So in the last 30 years, he's been experience work, uh, experiencing and working in this industry. So he's worked for JLL, CoreLogic, and General Electrics. Okay, he has a high passion and a passion a degree of, I guess, understanding property fundamentals, which is what his number one passion. But not just that, he worked in these industries over in Australia, over here in Australia, of course, and over in China as well. He, uh, he's looked at property in China. He even looked at stuff in the United States. You know, he specializes in AVMs, specializes in machine learning data, program management, and the list goes on. He's got a, a very long resume, but I'll get Ken to, you know, um, talk about, I guess, a bit about his history so you guys can get a bit more understanding of who he is. As well, he's got his own podcast or his co-host with his partner in crime, Mike Mortlock. Suburb, it's called Suburb Trolls. So if you go on the on the um, it's I'm pretty sure it's on Spotify and it's on as well on the iPod uh, some podcast app as well. Suburb Trolls, give it a listen. It's uh, they just talk about all sorts of things when it comes to property. So he's always their part, his partner in crime, Mr. Mike Mortlock. If you haven't heard his podcast as well, a little plug for himself. Uh, called geared for growth as well so that's uh today's topic i guess we're going to be talking about fundamentals when it comes to analyzing property markets how to i guess what are some of the key fundamentals to look out for you know avm uh, machine learning data programs i guess asking him about what's his predictions about the property market and just a whole bunch of other metrics when it comes to analyzing property fundamentals i think it's going to be a really impactful topic today Stay to the very end because Kent's, Kent is a wealth of knowledge and I've learned a lot from him in the past. And so I wanted to have him on the, on here today because I believe he'll give you a lot of value and a lot of insights about today and when it comes to analyzing property fundamentals, which I think a lot of people in today's society do not look at. And that's why I wanted to have him on because I feel 
people need to understand some of these fundamentals that he's going to be talking about because it's going to help you make an informed decision. We want to minimize the risk as much as possible when we're going into a location to invest for uh, i guess i'll build that property portfolio we want to make sure we're making the right decision because we're using other people's money so this is what today's all topic is all about help you guys be the best um property investor yourself but as well minimize that risk ken Bardner, thank you for joining uh, invest in you page or our podcast uh welcome aboard thank you for jumping on thank you frank it's great to be here so um it, Look, the viewers probably, some viewers may know, some may not. Introduce yourself, I guess, where you're from, what you've done in the previous year, uh, years. I know I've already kind of done a little bit of a demonstration beforehand, but I'll, it's best to hear it from yourself. Yeah, my, um, so uh, my name's Kent Lardner. Uh, I run a company called Suburb Trends. The uh, This has kind of been my recent um, project that's been running for a few years now. So what do Suburb Trends do? Uh, Suburb Trends focuses on property data and research. Um, my background is uh, started out in the property space through lenders mortgage insurance. So uh, back then the company was owned, this is late 90s, a company was owned by GE, General Electric, and they wanted to uh, look at products like automated valuation models, AVMs. So they paid me to go back to school at night and sent me off to Canada and the US to learn some, some rather uh, wise men. And uh, so I came back and I learned how to build automated valuation models. And then by then, GE decided to spin, up, spin it off into Genworth. So then the, the strategy had shifted and the company didn't want to pursue that anymore. So it was terrific for me. I got all this learning. Thank you very much. And right at that time, I got a knock on the door from um, a couple of members of the Ray White family that wanted to start a price finder. So we built the price finder system with some integrated AVM technology. And that back then, it was pretty cutting edge. Uh, and it was interactive and you could you know, effectively price up a property by saying same, better or worse, et cetera. And that helped uh, with, with a number of other features of that product set, helped build a competitive, a formative competitor to, uh, to RP Data. So we, um, we, we, we took on RP Data. That company sold and then I went and joined uh, CoreLogic as head of banking uh, and analytics, um, stayed with them and then stepped out of the Australian role into a China role for about 18 months. Um, so I was up in China helping a company trying to establish themselves as a core logic in China, working with a lot of the large banks over there and designing AVMs for them with a different approach. We were, we were actually training them on how to maintain and build their own AVMs. Um, so it was owned within the bank. So the biggest bank in the world took on my AVM methodology um, and, and they're off and running. Um, so then jumped out of that to a company called Real Estate View or portal, a real estate portal in, in Melbourne called Real Estate View. And we, I'd never done anything to do. I didn't even know what SEO was. So we built a landing page for every property, put an AVM on it and some information. And we took it up from 400,000 visitors a month up to 2.7 million. So that was an interesting project. And then straight out of that into what is today, which is Suburb Trends. Geez, you've done it all. So you've travelled the majority of the world, you've done AVMs all over the world, and it seems like you've had a journey in itself. I, I have. It's been fascinating. And now as yeah. I'm getting older, I can become one of those, you know, those old blokes that share stories, <laughs> you know. <laughs> oh, I've got a story for that. Oh, don't worry, you've plenty of time left, mate, so you'll probably have even more stories. <laughs> yeah. So I've actually got to say, though, I've, I've learned more in the last 12 months than I ever have. Yeah, I guess when you go out on your so this is your first time going out on your own with suburb trends. Your um, no, I've had a, a couple of little little um, uh, consulting type things, but this is the, the others were very much out of my own, but consulting. So you just you're an employee by another name, but this is my own proper, you know, fully funded bootstrap business. Yeah, once you do start your own venture, you learn uh, so much and you build so much well a wealth of knowledge moving forwards because you're, every day you're learning, so which is which is a beautiful thing. Yeah. So let's go to, I guess, so you went to China, you were doing AVMs there. I guess how different is that that mark or even the US or Canada mark compared to Australia? Is it the same fundamentals or is it everything kind of very similar to the same how everything works? Um, there are some similarities. Let's pick on China for a moment. So effectively, China was difficult because we didn't have a single source of truth for a sale price. So really what you had is some, some different practices without judgment. Um, the, ju the Effectively, you had prices that were shared publicly or 
prices that were shared with the bank that you tried to manipulate up to get a, a better LVR, a better loan, uh, prices you shared with the government to minimise your, your tax, uh, and then the real price. And what we found through the review of all the options that a way we could source data, the most robust data set we could use was the listing price, would you believe, the public domain listing price. The difference was they didn't tell you the apartment number. They would tell you the uh, building name and you would know what floor it was on. You would know its aspect, you know, north, northeast, whatever, and you would know total floors. So you had a lot of really powerful data, data within just the public listing, but you didn't know the individual unit number. So the difference there is you missed out on one thing. The thing you missed out on was the ability to go back and find the last sale price because you knew the property address, specifically the property. Um, and a common methodology used in all AVMs around the world is to go back and index it. If, if you've got a last sale record within 10 years, you would, you would index it, use that either as the end result or as an input. Um, so you didn't have that over there. But what you ended up with is ability to break it down to a square metre rate. Well, it was actually advertised as a square metre rate and you built your models on that public domain stuff, and it worked. And then when we benchmarked that against bank data or appraisal data, evaluation data, it was a pretty robust model. And then with the states and Canada, very they they use that methodology, or was it something a little bit different? Mm, no, the, the US was is is very advanced by comparison to Australia. So they they've got a, a really robust um, testing regime. There's a couple of companies over there. One of them called AV Metrics. Um, the other key, di so the differences of, of America in a nutshell, you've got a richer, deeper set of attributes. So how many floors there are, square metre, um, you know, the total square metre. Um, you would have um, a lot of the improvements. Uh, does it have air conditioning? Does it have a fireplace, et cetera? So your attribute data sets, et cetera, are all available at a property level and a much richer data set. So you can create a better AVM in the US, without a doubt, you can create a better product. Equally, they split new units and, and, and secondary. So then you can create indices for the two because they do behave differently. Um, so, so, yeah. Yeah, sorry, no, keep continuing. Okay. Yeah, so, so the American market has significantly, is much more mature. The data sets are better. The skill sets are better. You had a lot of skills coming out of the... Um, uh, the local councils, the equivalent of our local councils with their mass appraisals as well. So you've got a very big, solid, well-trained, mature industry over there with providers such as AV Metrics that do third-party testing. So, you know, solid, really solid. Canada, very similar to the, to the US, closer to the US than it is here. And then if we fast forward to, or we come over to Australia, what we've typically got um, you know, we've got a sale history, we've got lot size, we've got a property type, but we don't have the the, the real high quality breakdown of, of property styles, for example. So we don't have that property style. Um, but what we've recently been given is a, a, a government owned agency called a Geocoded National Address File, P, the old PSMA, GNAF. Uh, they've rebranded themselves as Geoscape. And what they've got is a lot of attribute layers. So you can buy some additional data sets to tell you the building footprint, building height through the use of LIDAR, you know, the laser rate radar. So there's some, some really good additional attributes you can acquire now, which brings us up a, a level, but we're still a long way off the, the, the quality of data and the richness of data of the US. Yeah, I was gonna say the Australian AVMs aren't very accurate especially at this moment, the property market is growing quite fast, but it's, it's never really been quite accurate. Is that fair to say? It's, you need to pick your pick your, your spots. So um, I, a lot of the reasons why that would be the case is the, the data reason would be number two. It would be the beach side and spread of values in a suburb, which would be a major contributor. So the uh, heterogeneous nature of our property markets would be a big driver. So AVMs, you will find if you're a user of them, you will find them working quite well in the inner suburbs, as in uh, the western suburbs or off the coastline. 
but suddenly when you get into the Blue Mountains or you, you know, suddenly when you're along the harbour suburbs or suddenly when you're along the beachside suburbs, that's where you'll see the problems because we struggle to find uh, matching comparables. So there's a couple of approaches to the way this model works. One of the biggest problems we've got at the moment is the old school regression, which was what used in the old council mass appraisals. That's all machine learning is times a thousand. So it's just this, this steroid fed version of a fitting a line through dots regression, multiple regression. So the kids are coming out of school and they're just thinking machine learning fixes everything, magic wand, boom, I built a model. And the models of those particular, that approach, machine learning to an AVM is very dated by comparison to a sophisticated technique that emulates how a valuer or a real estate agent would do a CMA or evaluate it as a valuer, valuation. And what they typically do is you, you match comparables and you're handpicking those comparables as a human and using your, your ability to judge for quality. What the algorithms do is matches on, match uses uh, data that it can match on, but it doesn't have the eye for quality. So the gap for us, for an AVM to step up and start to more closely emulate how a valuer would perform or a local agent would perform is to start to address some of those qualitative differences. And that yeah. will come in due course. Uh, and a lot of that will come from, for example, uh, uh, looking at uh, satellite images, looking at maps and making a judgment on how close you are to things. Now, you can do that with the data sets, but you can also do it from a map. So, you know, your proximity to stuff, uh, but then uh, looking at photos. So um, there's ability. This is where the term AI does come in and mean something. Yeah, AI looking at a photo and then converting the photo system data. So, for example, they call it a Likert scale, so 1 to 5 or 1 to 10. Um, you've got uh, the ability to look at it and say, is that house renovated? Is that kitchen renovated? Is that bathroom renovated? If you can master that, you're going to take a significant leap forward closer to the way an appraiser or a real estate agent works. I tested that a couple of years ago, three years ago, with a company out of Spain, and, and it wasn't there yet. And we'll, I was feeding it, fed it a few um, hundred um, bathroom photos of different standards, and the results were weren't as good as what I'd like. But I'm going to imagine that in three years they've probably made some improvements, but I haven't tested it in that time. Yeah, the amazing thing of technology and what it can do for, I guess, helping society in all walks of life, it's uh, it's amazing. So I want to kind of touch, go back to like AVMs because a lot of the listeners that we have listening are probably first-time investors or new to investing. An AVM, just break it down basically so they can, uh, in a dummy format, so they understand what it actually is. Yeah, so an AVM just gives you a price estimate. Now, it's a price yeah. es estimate as of today. And... It will work well in simple suburbs where, you know, property A, property B and property C are very similar. And that's what I'll call heterogeneous. It won't work well in a, a suburb that might have a $4 million house, a $2 million house and a stack of, you know, $1 million houses, et cetera. The, those type of coastal suburbs, they're the ones that, you know, cause a bit of grief. But if you go into those homogenous suburbs where... Properties are similar, your house and land areas, they're going to eat it up. They'll work quite well. Um, so just knowing how they work, one trick, one trick for somebody looking to use these is to find the property that you're interested in. Now, what will happen if a property is listed for sale, they will switch the AVM off because they don't want to upset the selling agent, right? So this is standard practice. So the AVM gets switched off. That's fine. All you've got to do is walk up and down the street in the virtual walk through Google Street View and find properties that are similar to the one that's listed for sale. So in most cases, you'll find one, two or three properties that are similar. Now, if you can find them similar in terms of dimension and style and quality, then all you've got to do is group them together and take an average. And you're effectively doing a job that's significantly closer to the way a valuer would do their job anyway. 
Mm, for sure. So an, AB, an ABM, I guess, for the listeners, it's what you get, go to the bank or your broker and they'll download a, a core logic report and it'll be a valuation report, correct? Yeah. So typically the way banks use AVMs, it's uh, you know, LVR and loan. It's risk. Let's just group it together and say low, low risk, fine. Usually, uh, if you go back to the way the APRA standards were drawn up, they would give you plenty of latitude to just use contract of sales and you wouldn't need anything more than that. So in most cases, the AVM's just been replaced that contract of sale as a check for the bank's own sanity, you know, and, and they've actually a little bit above what the APRA regulatory requirement is. Um, some may use them a step above where the APRA says you're allowed to use them in these lower LVR, lower um, lower risk locations. So that's fine. They can use them there. But the most of the use case of these things is pretty much as a QA check, help you with workflows, validate a, a valuation, et cetera. Uh, and the second one would be portfolio. Um, so you kind of look at the value of your portfolio. Um, but the big call out here is if you've got a formal appraisal or a formal valuation, uh, whether that be a full appraisal or a desktop, you're probably better off just indexing them rather than applying an AVM to them. So the, the beauty of an index applied to a formal valuation that might, own, might be four or five years old is that's going to account for the quality issue that we spoke about a moment ago, is we've already captured the fact that that property is an elite property relative to its peers. So that's captured in that valuation. Now all we're going to do is adjust it for market movement in the last few years to come up with a current market value. So a lot of the banks kind of do consider the value of doing an index applied to the original evaluation as their preferred method to look at the total value of their book. That same principle applies to somebody with a portfolio today. So if you've got three or four properties, you could either get an AVM, which is the easy way to do it with its error, or you can apply an index to it. And if you apply an index to it, you're probably going to get a lot more accurate result. Yeah, definitely, for sure. I want to, I want to, I want to go back, Ken, to your, I guess, your childhood and, bring, and your upbringing. Were, were your parents property investors or where did you get the niche to go down this, this road? It's very interesting. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a poor house kid. So I think my fascination with property came from having nothing. You know, not own, we didn't even own a car. It was just my mother and I, no car, no money, seat of our pants, housing commission, Macquarie Fields, and then I moved to Villawood. And then I ended up with a, a, my mother remarried later and I was in a high school in it, um, a place called Granville South. So a rough Western suburbs childhood, but it was a good, it was a good upbringing because of, I would argue, because of migrants, because I got into a little a click of migrant kids who became beautiful, close friends and their families embraced me. So I'm, you can probably guess I'm very pro-migration because of my my background. And so from there, that that inspired you to go down the, was it always property from the very beginning or you kind of just fell into it and it was uh, like, oh, is Yeah, it's interesting. My first um, seven, five, six, seven years um, of my working life was in the uh, telecommunications pay TV industry. So I carved out an industry, uh, carved out a career designing cable TV networks. So it's all numbers based, similar thing. So it was, my fascination is the numbers more than anything else. I love the numbers side of it. So I was designing cable networks. So I'd fly, charter a plane, go to a, a remote mining community, design their cable network and come home again. Um, built the cable network or designed a lot of the cable network uh, and project up for Darwin, et cetera, et cetera. So I did that for several years, but then that project kind of the capital spend had happened. It's, it ran its course and they, you know, the company that I was working for made 30 odd percent of this workforce redundant. So then I was pushed out and I went into the mortgage insurance business from that. So it was a, a early in life, a change in career. But my fascination, I, it was numbers based. So I think one thing I like to call out is I love property data more than I love property. So you always just add that data piece. I'm obsessed with the data. So you're a data nerd. You love numbers, spreadsheets, very analytical. 
Very much. That's my, yeah. So, you know, went back to study statistics at school um, and economics. So, yeah, that's my that's my interest is is looking at the data. I you know, love designing the AVMs. And now what I've done is I've stepped away from looking at the property and building models, models for the property to very much focusing on models to analyze market risk. Okay. So now when you're, now what you've created from a level, I know you talk a lot about SA3 now and there's SA4 or it goes from SA1 all the way to four, I'm pretty sure. It what does. is an SA level and explain to the viewers and then, okay, talk about the difference of why you use an SA3 compared to an SA4, for example. Yeah, absolutely. So small, start with the smallest building block, a statistical area one. I'll just call them SA1, SA2 now. So this is the smallest building block that the Australian Bureau of Statistics, I'll just say ABS from now on, that the ABS will divulge your census data without risking giving away personalised information. So if they did it at a street level, you could kind of work out what family A earns and what family B earns for income. But when you do it at a cluster of, say, 200 homes, that's not a high enough risk. So they effectively serve it up at that SA1 level. So the SA1 um, is very, very good for the census level information. And as we know, that's a bit dated now. So we're in that stale tail end of the old census but it still works in the models. And I'll explain that a little bit later on and how the, the machine learning models can work with this. Um, so that's a, an SA1. You really can't do a lot of property level stuff at an SA1 because it's too small in terms of trends or medians, et cetera. But you could, in, uh, in theory, you could create a median using the AVM. So if you've got an AVM for every property in the country, you can cluster them together and come up with a median for the SA1. So that's an SA1. The next one up is an SA2. So uh, probably the simplest way to understand what an SA2 is, it's about three suburbs big and it's a nice clean outline. So, um, you know, it might have, some of them might have two suburbs, some of them might have three. And what they do is they name these based on the predominant suburb. So the, the, the biggest suburb in that cluster is the name and often it's hyphenated. So it's the first the largest and the second largest suburb with a hyphen in between. So that's SA2s. Now, SA2s do start to become really relevant and interesting and significant for trends and property data, but still not always. Um, so they're still patchy because we don't have enough sales in every SA2 to have a reliable and robust na nationwide series of metrics. It's good, but it's not as good as it's, bigger brother which is an SA3 so when we go up to an SA3 <clears throat> excuse me it's probably most likened to a, a, an LGA but LGAs became redundant from in my world once the um, aggregation or amalgamation started so if you go to Brisbane or if you go to Gold Coast it's one big city it's one big LGA for the whole of Brisbane um, just stopping short up up north um, so that became a bit of a problem because Brisbane's not one bit market. It's not one housing market. It's multiple housing markets. So the the Goldilocks measure I have found is called the SA3. And there's about 350 of these, but in reality, you've got enough data to reliably build models for just over 300 housing markets. And then a lot less for units because units, you won't find a lot of units in remote, re, re, regional, rural locations. So give or take, I'm rounding here, 300 housing markets you can build good models for using an SA3 and about 150 uh, unit models at an SA3. So why the SA3? If you look at prices and the distribution of prices at an SA3 level, in most cases, they look like your bell-shaped curve. So you don't need to do transformations that make things complex and can sometimes give you a skewed result. You can leave them. You don't have to touch them or manipulate them. And you can do a median. You can say, this is the median price. This is what the median price is today. And this is what it was a year ago. And this is what it was two years ago. And you look at the price change as a pretty robust measure of capital growth. Okay. So you're getting, you're, you're getting a more accurate reading from an SA3 level. And is, is that something that they're using 
in America or in Canada that you know NSA three level, or they use they call it something different. They've all got different things. Um, so in counties, uh, different divisions. So uh, everyone's got their own uh, measure. Um, zip codes is a still a common one used in in America for medians as well. Um, the problem with postcodes is in Australia, for example, I'll speak to the Australian example, postcodes are designed for delivery of post. LGAs are designed for collection of garbage. So, the, you know, what we want to do is use geographical boundaries that are designed for st statistical functions. So that's why the SAs are so good. That's why I love the ABS. I'm a fanboy. So um, what the Americans do well in their long list of things they do extraordinarily well is they've got a measure, measurement or an index that uses repeat sales of the same property. So if you see a property sell once and then sell twice, you've got two points of information, time and change in price. And when you throw those in a bucket for a given ge a geograph geographical area, you can come up with a pretty neat index. So that's called a Case-Shiller repeat sale index model. I've tried that. We built that, I built an iteration of this in at um, Price Finder and I've you know, played around with it. The problem we've got in Australia is um, it, it can work quite well for units because units typically sell every seven years, right? It used to be five. It's just gradually widening out. Uh, it, it works well for, for units generally. Um, it works well for rentals because rentals turn over every three and a half years. So rentals works well for rentals, houses or units. That's fine. That's the repeat index method. But for houses, we've got a problem because we've got a fairly shallow base. We've got a shallow pool of properties that list at a suburb level anyway, right? Not a lot list. Same problem we spoke about earlier. Then you factor in that the length of hold period, that, that hold period used to be about 10 and it's getting up to 12 and it's kind of getting up to about 14 years on average now. So the whole period is getting longer and longer and longer. So then the problem you've got is the longer it gets, the harder it gets for that particular methodology, that case shiller repeat sale methodology to work well. Then the other problem for houses is people renovate them. So you need to make sure you've got the data that captures and allows for and factors in how much money did you spend on the renovation? Because that's just going to go straight onto it and amplify the result or distort the growth result. So it's got its limitations, especially in Australia, because of our longer hold period, whereas the US doesn't have that longer hold period. So the bottom line is you've really only got a couple of approaches. You've got an approach that says, um, let's get an AVM today and let's get an AVM next month for the same property for as every property in the suburb. And we'll measure that as our index. So that's your, you know, your hedonic index methodology that effectively uses AVMs, uh, or you can just roll them up and measure them an S, as an SA3. Takes you 30 seconds to explain the methodology to a you know, government client or a business client or a consumer, and you're done with it. I'll go the simple method, method every day. Yeah, for sure. So when you're doing a, an analysis, what are some of the key metrics that you look at when analyzing a property market? Um, I like this two key lead, lead indicators. Um, Australia has been hooked on days on market. I use days on market, but it's not my preference. And my models that I use tell me that it's not its preference either. Inventory is my preference for the capital measuring capital markets and other, you know, so effectively, I won't talk about rents for the moment. So anything I mentioned here, we're talking about sales and <clears throat> capital. So uh, inventory is my go-to. That's my main metric. And inventory, what is it? It's if you've got 100 properties for sale and you're selling on average, so if you've got on average 100 properties for sale and you're selling 20 per month on average, 100 divided by 20, five months of inventory. So typically, the theory is this. If no other property listed for sale today, it would take five months to have nothing left on the shelves. And that's the th that's the that's that's what inventory is. America does this very, very well. I'm just going to pause and take a quick drink because I'm drying out on the throat. Yeah, go for it. So um, America does inventory well. So I've been here, I've adopted that for Australia. So um, typically what you've got is two measures when it comes to inventory. What is it now? Is it low? Is it medium or is it high? If it's low, 
it's a, a lot more buyers than there are sellers. And you know, anything lower than three months of inventory means it's a market where people are going to be bidding up prices out of frustration. So, so that's that sums up the situation of where does it sit today? What is the current inventory sit? Then so you is, there the lagging, is there lagging to, lagging time or data when you get this inventory level? How long is that that measured up for? Uh, it, yeah, so inventory typically looks at what is the average sale per month. And then you can stretch that out and do it. You can shorten that up or you can widen it out. You can do it a few ways. I like to effectively look at a 12 month and then average it out so I don't have too many blips. I like inventory to be smooth. Um, <clears throat> so I, I look at the 12 months and how, how much is sold in the last 12 months and then break it down to what's it likely to sell this month. What I also do is apply a bit of funky machine learning to forecast what the sale volume will be in the next few months. So I forecast sales volume using machine learning. So it's a forecast that throws in a bucket load of different data sets and time series data, goes into a bucket and forecasts sale volume. So that's measure one. Measure two is listings. What's the average number of listings? Same thing. You've got historical listings over the last two years. And you know what the average you, you've seen every month, how many listings I see in that SA3. And then you throw that into your ML bucket with all the other data sets and you forecast what sales volumes will be. Sorry, what listings volumes will be. So now I've got two metrics. Total listings forecast, total sales forecast, average. Combine them together as a, a ratio. What have you got? Months of inventory. Interesting. So, so, so then you, you, yeah, you start yeah. the inventory dropping. Have you worked out a formula? If you start to see it dropping by a certain percentage in a certain in a certain amount of time, you can kind of predict how much the property market can kind of grow. I know it sounds a bit more sophisticated, but is that something you you might be you can work out down the track? Oh, you you do. I I can, but um, there's, you always dampen your statements. You always kind of you add some weasel words to it because that's what you're taught in school, how you present these things. Um, because there's always things that happen. There's always other data sets. There's always, you know, stuff that sits outside of your, your, your sphere of knowledge or sits outside your model that upsets your model. So that, you know, the saying, the old saying goes, all models are hopeless. Some are less hopeless than others, right? So what you, you do is you, you, you wash it down, and you still want to sound confident, but you want to sound realistic. And these models, you get presented a model and someone puts their hand on their heart and they look you deep in the eye and they say, this is the best thing. You go, oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm a little bit doubtful. You need that skepticism. So with that, with that disclaimer, I'll put that to one side. What you do is you've got uh, the ability to forecast inventory. Now, inventory itself, we know that there's a correlation between the movement of inventory. When inventory is trending down, there's upward pressure on price. When inventory's pushing up, there's downward pressure on price, but at different rates. It's a different speed and a different reaction on the way up than it is on the way down. Two models, up and down, based on trend. The second thing you've got is what category I sit in. Am I under three? Am I between three and five? Am I between five and seven? Am I between seven and nine or am I over nine? When you start to split these up and for today, let's just split them into two to make life easy. <clears throat> you know, if I'm under six and over six, right? If I'm over six, I start to behave differently than I do under six. So the trends and the price pressure works very, very differently in the lower categories. But then when you step out of a low category and suddenly you jump from two months to seven months, things do start to change. So the problem you've got with these models is it's not smooth. It's kind of lumpy. You go from, you know, a market condition A to market condition B, et cetera. You need to change significantly. You need a big move for you to start to see significant price changes or trends in your price change. So... Don't jump at shadows is the message here. If you kind of jump from one month to two months, you don't say the sky's falling. Uh, if you jump from two months to two and a half months, you don't panic. But if you jump from three months to five months, 
you will see a difference. You will start to see significant changes in the price movement. So with 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 uh, inventory, you need if you if you're looking at a suburb and it's got inventories jumping up all over the place, that means maybe the listings are quite low and there hasn't been many listings. Can that be an eff- that's going to have an effect on that inventory? Is that correct? I think the best way to look at it is a single panel, and you look at um, how many listings there are and trend of listings volumes. Then you look at the inventory. Then you look at the price, and you look them in one window, in one set, and you will grasp. Just instinctively, you will get what's going on. Usually what happens is listings go up and inventory goes up with it. But it is sometimes a slightly different slope of the curve. And that way you can can understand supply and demand. By looking at those three things, you get a pretty good feel on supply and demand. Because that's probably one. Of the, that's probably the, one of the key fundamentals, I guess. You're looking at for for the, what makes a property market move: high versus demand. So, yeah. what's your kind of? You've got your inventory. What's your other? I say top three. Well, I know there's probably more, but I guess analysis tools that you would use to help with, I guess, from a demographic level. Yeah. I look, um, I like uh, inventory at a, an SA three level, and for the trends. I like the SA3, uh, the inventory trend uh, SA3. I like the inventory current at an SA3. Then I go to the suburb and I look at the same thing, but I wouldn't plot the suburb in a graph because it bumps around. <clears throat> so that's the first thing. The second thing I do now is I I like to look at a, a suite of things. Uh, a couple of key things I like um, to look at is at a suburb level, the price segmentation. I really like price segmentation. And what that does, it says, looking at all the sales in the last 12 months, how many sold in this price bracket, how many sold in that, how many sold in that, and you break it down. And you look at that, and that'll tell you a couple of things. If that's normally distributed, like your bell-shaped curve, you say, okay, the median, I could probably trust the median a bit more. But if that's lumpy, like a beachside suburb, it tells me a lot about the median price for that suburb and how much I can or cannot rely on it. The second thing a price segmentation tells me is where am I buying relative to the market? Am I buying in the top price segment with an ambition to do a 200K renovation and sell at another 200K profit and invent a whole new price segment that hasn't existed in the last 12 months? So looking at price segments tells me a lot about where I sit with either a current property or a purchase property. So price segmentation is very, very valuable. Amazing. So price segmentation gives you. So when it when it, can that give you would sorry, let's go back to let's go back to the imagery because I'm kind of curious with when you're looking at a market, a suburb, and you're looking maybe it's starting that growth phase, is that probably one of the key fundamentals to look out for that can give you an understanding, okay, where it's at the beginning or if it's at, I guess it's already started and you're maybe a bit too late. Can is that a way you can kind of help you do your analysis? It does, absolute. Um, so typically what you find is that if, and I'm generalizing here, but if I were to give you a general statement, if there's a, a, a movement in inventory heading down, suddenly it's going to be up at say nine or 10 months and then you start to see it falling down. This is happening in the apartment market right now, right across the country. So apartments are starting to find their mojo. Okay, <clears throat> so what happens usually is you'll see that turn up in your pricing within four months, which kind of makes sense, right? Settlement, by the time you process the data, by the time the data serves up and becomes meaningful in your charts, especially if you're using a rolling 12-month median, you can understand why there's a four-month lag in it. So typically, you're wanting to see the tipping points and the tipping points, um, and then when it steps below nine and it gets into a new category, from nine to eight, mm, but nine down to six, game on. So that that's a that's a biggie. So watch the, watch the trends in in the inventory. Now, what we're seeing at the moment, by and large, is a lot of apartment markets are being pushed up. Demand's going up because of affordability. It's the new thing, right? So, yeah, you know, we had the exodus as the the hot hot button, the hot topic for the last two years. Uh, that's still going to be a trend, but the next new trend is where can I afford? in a city as a first home buyer, I've got no option. So what are the best apartment suburbs I can find is kind of the the new, the new thing, right? Yeah. Correct. 
So yeah, I think that's that's just getting they're getting built up, in, you know, going crazy at the moment with, you know, developers just building up all these, you know, apartments, but they're having a they're not, you're not seeing any growth from those, I guess. So from as an investor point of view, you want to try and find those great locations. I guess a, a nice house because land is king. You know, yeah. Right? So when you're, I guess, with demographic level, so what are some of uh, something to look out for from a demographic level point of view? I guess you've got some of this on your suburb suburb trends. What are yes. some of the key fundamentals you want to be looking at from a demographic perspective? Yeah, the one I like the most is called uh, a socioeconomic index. Um, now, this is called CIFA. Um, so it's a it's an advantage and disadvantage in, index, 1 to 10, created by the ABS. And what it says is um, relative, this suburb or this SA1, because it's down to the SA1 neighbourhood, uh, it's also at a suburb level, it tells me, uh, where that sits relative to the rest of state, measuring a, fa- a range of variables, incomes one, education's another, access to facilities and transport, etc. So it's a broad, it's a it's a broad church approach to it, which effectively says one is the least advantage, ten is the most. And I think the most valuable thing of this is the distribution of it. So what I've done, and this is free on the suburb trends map is I've taken the score of each of those SA1s and in because I'm so in love of, with distributions, I've served that up as a distribution. So you'll know the proportion of less advantaged neighbourhoods and the proportion of more advantaged neighbourhoods. And you can see that as a distribution in the same way you can look at prices as a distribution. Oh, very interesting. Very interesting. So that, that, that all has a... a... They all relate and help with influencing that market as well. It, it well, I think it does. Um, so typically, what we found in the last uh, twenty-four months is the more ad, uh, advantaged suburbs across the country have grown significantly more in terms of capital growth than the least um, advantaged. So there's something to be said for the C for index when applying and looking at now. So there's a the modeling perspective, but then there's the neighborhood advantage or the neighborhood perspective. If you are looking to buy a unit, for example, if I'm looking to buy a unit for 500,000 and I had the choice of a C for index of three or a C for index of nine or 10, which one would you pick? And I'd go for the higher one. Why is it? Why, I, why, so why would you go for the higher one? I would go for the higher one because that tells me that there's, it's a more advantaged suburb. So if I'm, I'm buying it as an owner occupied, I would say, great, there's going to be uh, a, 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 a higher, more advantaged neighbourhood, a different persona, different profile to suburb A versus suburb B or neighbourhood A versus neighbourhood B. So picking the more advantaged neighbourhood may be my preference. Mm-hmm. They're each to their own. But there's a statistical uh, reasoning behind it. But equally, at a personal level, if it were my choice, I'd go for the 10. I'd live with the snobs. Mm. <laughs> of course. So of course, and that's going to have, I guess, more, you're going to see more of your growth as well from those potentially. Mm. potentially. That's what we've seen in the last two years. So, you know, it, it doesn't guarantee that that's going to be the case. But the, you know, the, the growth rate in the top quintile versus the bottom quintile in Sydney, for example, has been hovering at five to six times. So the wealthy, the wealthy are getting rapidly wealthier. The price gap or the wealth gap is getting very, very big in Australia. If you're using housing as the lead indicator of that, it will tell you black and white. The gap between the top 20% and the bottom 20%, purely based on house values, is growing at a rate of five a difference of a factor of five. Yeah, it's amazing. And I guess the middle class, the middle class can kind of chop down there going over to the bottom or top there. And there's there's a big wealth range of wealth movement at the moment, isn't there? There Which is, you- yeah, a bit of a global phenomenon, isn't it? Um, yeah. yeah, it's a bit of a sad thing because I, I loved the idea of an Australia, a fair go for all, which we used to be a part of our you know culture. I think we lost it. You know, I felt that in the 1990s, we went from a hero was Paul Hogan and we switched it over to Gordon Gecko. <laughs> and 
it's it's, it has, it's amazing how things change and it happens quite slowly but fast at the same time you know so yeah the last 30 years things have changed dramatically but it's been a long time but it's just happened so slow but so fast yeah i just uh, it used to be the case we're about 15 years behind the us on a lot of things i just hope we we're no longer pegged last thing we want to do is go down that path with our culture and our you know the breakdown of democracy um, yeah, well, I don't think we want. We don't want what they've got. No, definitely. Australia's a beautiful country. Hopefully, it stays the way it is and it keeps moving forward. Yeah, We're very unique. So, I guess with these, you know, the more top end markets as well. We, do you see a, a large range of mortgage outlays for these so, sort of homes, or because it's quite funny when I look at data, you don't really. There's not much information that can give you. Are these, I guess, top end markets? Are, are, are these uh, people buying these homes outright? Is that why we're seeing, I guess, such a change as well? Of, of this is, yeah, it's, it's standard um, data from census that t- uh, tells you the rental tenure, or it's, it's a, the, the section of census is tenure. So they tell you the percentage of properties owned outright, uh, percentage owned with mortgage, and percentage rented. Now, these are really valuable, um, uh, call it demographic, if you want to call it that data that from the census that I would consider really, really valuable for an investor. You know, let's pick on the first one before we answer the question about the elite suburbs. Um, rental tenure, you want to know that the market exists. So you probably wouldn't want something that has less than 10% rental tenure because it's a pretty shallow rental pool. And you probably wouldn't want something with more than 50% rental tenure because they're the volatile ones, especially in the last few years. We've seen some significant levels of volatility in and around Docklands and other high density areas. So high density means high rental tenure means high volatility, right? Pretty simple rule. Whereas you find a sweet spot which might be close to the national average of about 34% rental tenure, it's a bit of it's it's the right fit in my humble view. So between 10 and maybe 40 is a good range, but you know, 30, 35, yeah, pretty good. Let's get back to the elite suburbs. <clears throat> what most people don't realise is the wealthiest suburbs have the highest percentage owned outright. Very Interest rates nice. going up, they do cartwheels. All right? right. They're not mortgage holders. So we need to kind of change our blinkers and not think like that. When things get tough, vacancy rates go up, they own six units, they don't care, they hold them. They aren't going to be lining up to flog them because they're owned outright. They're wealthy, pretty simple. So is that something as well when you're looking into an area that look out making sure that there's a large number of outright homes in a particular suburb? Owned outright is a really solid metric if you're in it for the long haul because they're in it for the long haul. So when things get shaky, they don't panic. Now, this is this was often and as if often the case if you kind of measure out the eastern suburbs north of Sydney, an SA3, you know, one of the most elite areas in the country um whenever we've gone through gfc's or unemployment problems whatever 80s 90s whatever they their market's flat they go flatline they just hold they're too smart and then things come on again they are holding there's no fire sales in these markets probably the long-term game it's not a short-term game it's well for these people it is because they can afford to play the long game Whereas I think a lot of people who bank everything and don't have much scope for interest rate movement uh, or don't have scope for having kids or a job loss or losing a part-time, if they overextend, um, they're, the, they're the ones that make up the volatile markets for sales. And so with as well, when you're looking into a, a region, if we go to household income versus mortgage uh, repayments, is there a certain percentage as well that... You want to be kind of targeting as well that will help with uh, identifying those locations? Uh, it's a yes and no answer. It's one of those. Sorry to do that to you. So Demographia has been around for quite some time and they set a standard to say if you're spending more than 30% of your income, uh, your household income on a mortgage, you're in, you're, you're, it's, a, it's a high risk, uh, over leveraged uh, category. So on their affordability index, they kind of draw the line at about 30%. Now, I think we're well and truly above that. Um, We are one of the least affordable. But here's the rub. When they're measuring income, they're measuring income at a suburb level or a city level or a region level. 
the, it's the median income. It's not the median income of the people who bought houses in the last five years. So if you really wanted to measure what this metric, measure this accurately, you want to say for the last 100 homes that have been mortgaged in suburb X or suburb Y, what was their income and what was their, this subset of the suburb? We're only interested in the people's incomes relative to the mortgage, the mortgage holders. We don't want to include all the pensioners. We don't want to include the income of all the people in that suburb that are sitting on two million dollar houses but earning three hundred bucks a week on a pension. So this is the problem. It's the sampling is a problem with that approach because you've got so many people that are cash poor, asset rich that are included in the sample because you're taking the average income from census, which is the wrong approach. What matters is the mortgage serviceability. The data set I'm interested in is on the mortgage application. If I could get all the mortgage applications in that suburb for the last few years, that's the only data I want. I don't want the census data. Yeah, I love how you break it down and you try to get to the nitty gritty and find the the, the cause effect and try and put, put a... Um solve that problem I love, I love yeah this is the problem with averages and you know we're using census data we're taking an average income the average income may not reflect the income on that mortgage application that's your problem mm. Very interesting and so i want to talk about population growth because for me per personally i think overseas migration doesn't really affect too much of the property market i think your internal migration has more of an effect and I've kind of, you've kind of seen since COVID that it's had a, a significant effect, like you said, the excess of the affordable lifestyle. Is that what you're seeing today? And then will that, will that trend continue? Um, probably the first thing is the, the mortgage population, a lot of that's already built in. You know, the government's already planned for it. Local governments have already planned for it, et cetera. So a lot of population growth doesn't show up in your, your, your housing market models, et cetera. Because it's already planned for, it's already built in, it's already factored in with supply, etc. Um, what we will find, though, with the sudden opening of the borders is a very different argument. Suddenly, we will see a step change in demand. That's the reality. And when that comes into a situation where we've got an inability to rapidly meet that demand, houses can't be built in two weeks. So what we will find is a sudden impact on housing markets with the opening of the borders because people will come in and they will need somewhere to live and we have a shortage of stock building approvals if you look at building approvals they haven't had that nice consistent increase year on year it's we've had blips we've got some regions that have extraordinarily low ratios of building approvals versus housing stock yet their inventory levels are low vacancy rates are below one percent they are in trouble. And if we open up borders and just throw in an extra 10 families in Atari Gloucester, it's, it could be, you know, it's already tipped. It only makes things really, really hard for those people. So the problem we've got with the influx of people coming in, depending on where they choose to live and, and whether they choose to rent or buy, they are going to put a lot of pressure on the lower rung, uh, the, the people who are already struggling in Australia are going to be the people hurt the most. So this will have an impact. Mm. So second part of the question was, will this exodus happen? Um, you know, 30, 40 years ago, we were talking about the impact of the baby boomers retiring. They're still retiring. It's still happening. Um, so there's the tail end of boomers retiring and and, and a lot of them have been holding on you know, not making a decision either because they're indecisive or they're holding on to try and wring out that last bit of capital growth for their house on the North Shore of Sydney, et cetera, before they move down the surf coast or before they move to Byron or Noosa or wherever. That's still happening and that's going to be happening at a great rate of knots in the coming year. And then you add to that, you've still got the exodus of the digital nomad. So the regions will continue down the path they're on. And I know some pundits have been saying, oh, the, the, the regional boom will end or whatnot. 
there are some interesting things that's happened. I've, I've noticed some spots where you, you, you look at a spot that's covered in green, covered in land, and all it takes is one tick of a pen to open up another subdivision and a place like Bellingen could have an extra two or 300 lots, instant, bang. And I look at a place like Bellingen and, you know, mid-north coast here, beautiful spot, and houses in the city there are getting city-level prices. So my question is, will that remain? And the answer to that is uh, yes, if they don't do the tick of the box. But if they do the tick of the box and say time to time to subdivide, time to sell the old family farm, that could change for a lot of the seat that's the tree change locations. Whereas I think there's less risk for the sea change because of finite supply. There's not that many farms along the coast of Coffs Harbour. There is on the other side of the highway banana plantations that could be subdivided, but it depends on your location. So the sea change, tree change, regional locations, the biggest risk they've got is what happens to the planning and subdivision. So I guess, I guess with those sort of locations, those regionals, I guess it comes down to having a look at what are the economic drivers, what's happening, infrastructure projects, stuff like that can help you, I guess, make a more of an informed decision than some of these, you know, other regional towns that, that really don't have too much going for it, where they've got a large vacant block of land around it or farming area. And I guess that can have an effect if there's nothing really driving that market as well. So that's something to kind of look out for as well, I think, moving, you know. If you Absolutely. Yeah, I think a lot of, um, there's been a lot of motion in the last couple of years, people just wanting to get out and you see some beautiful photos with a beautiful vista and you move and then you realise what you've moved to. So I think that's going to be a bit of a challenge and it would be a challenge where those people decide to do something about it en masse. So what's your take on, I guess, the Sydney and Melbourne markets, a big two tyrant, what do you see the next year or two where they're heading? Um, let's focus on, say, the next year. Um, I know a lot of the banks have been making these big, bold statements, as they do, about negative growth rates. And at this stage, I can't support or see those negative growth rates. Uh, I can see some slowing as a result of the hard data telling me that inventory levels are starting to build. So, you know, listings are building, but demand is still there. <clears throat> so the question is, um, inventory levels nudging up, but it hasn't done that step change that we spoke about earlier. It hasn't gone from one to six. It's gone from one and a half to two. So it's still a very, very tight market in most of these city suburbs. So they're still tight. They're not as tight. So that tells me that price growth will ease, but I can't support the statement of negative at all. We're going from 160 kilometres an hour down to 110 yeah, yeah, it's, it's slowly, slowly, inventory is starting to increase. And who knows, I guess there has been a large number of people move out of Melbourne and Sydney and gone to, you know, your regional towns or if not to Queen, a lot of people being gone to Queensland. Would you feel, uh, for me personally, I feel like Queensland's probably one of the places, I guess, in the next year or so, it's going to be a place where you're going to see some really strong growth. Do you have like a top three tier of states that you feel that are, are going to do quite well in the year, year to come? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um so at an asset class, you've got units are going to do rather well in Sydney, Melbourne, without a doubt. <clears throat> but the call out there is don't judge on what's happening in the last 12 months in terms of price change. Always look at the 10-year. So at the asset class of units, be careful of. It's you know, going to be pretty much half the growth rate of houses. So let's just park that and move on. Um, outside of that, the, the Queensland, without a doubt. But the, the surprise packet that most people aren't thinking about South Australia, just gosh, it's doing well. So it South Australia, case. rock solid. So I'd say number one, South Australia is the one to watch for 2022, followed by Queensland, followed by Tasmania. The Apple Isle is still just, it's just been this relentlessly strong performer. So there, you, if you pick three states, it would be those three states. I don't understand, Tazzy. It just keeps going and going. It's like, where does this growth come from? Is this going where does it? Growth? Yeah. Um, you know, no. I, I, the COVID bit has helped. Um, but equally, and I'm just going to grab another sip of water so I can talk about it. Um, we were always worried about the job situation. So when we were doing risk profiles of areas in the mortgage insurance space, you'd worry about jobs because 
people had moved there and then couldn't find a job or lost their job and they moved back to the mainland. But the digital nomad and the work from home movement has changed Tasmania forever. So as long as they're they're interwebs stay connected, I'm not allowed to say interwebs. My wife hears me say interwebs, I get into trouble. That's why I say it. Um, the issue is, um, uh, as long as their internet stays connected, it's it's the future down there. But equally, farming practices, you name it, it's got a lot going for it. Yeah, it just keeps it just keeps going and going, and uh, who knows where it's going to go in the next five to ten years? But it's uh, it's looking quite good at this point in time. Yeah. It is. Well, Ken, look, it's it's been an absolute pleasure. You've got a wealth of knowledge. Uh, I think a lot of people have got a lot of value from today's topics. Um, I guess where can people find you? I guess I know you're on a podcast as well. You know, plug, go give yourself a little plug. Uh, I think people will get a lot of benefit from, you know, your wealth of knowledge. Yeah, so um, three spots for you to, to go to, suburbtrends.com. So you'll find a lot of free stuff there. Um, you'll you'll find me talking this type of stuff on Elephant in the Room, um, another podcast with um, Veronica Morgan and Chris Bates. And the third one, if you're, it's a little bit more risque. It's a little less serious and it's got a lot of swear words. Uh, that one's called Suburb Trolls. That's just silliness on a Friday. Beautiful, yeah, love it. I love it. If you, your partner in crime, Mister Mike Warlock, is it? Yes, on um, we do have a bit of fun. And we just we just double dose on silly. Beautiful. You can never get too old, mate. You gotta always stay young inside. So <laughs> no, I appreciate it today. It's been uh, amazing and I look forward to doing it again next time. Terrific. Thank you, Frank. So there you have it. We had Mr. Kent Lardner, wealth of knowledge. Now you're probably listening or you've listened to this podcast and you're going, Jesus Christ, there was so much valuable information there. Now go back, listen to this again. Because you're always going to get more value every time you go back and listen to it twice. Maybe share it with a friend. Uh, visit his website, you know, suburbtrends.com. Uh, you've got some really good data. Hard. If you're a data nerd and you love data, looking at data, go there. It'll help you make a good informed decision. But he touched on a lot of good points. A lot of good points that I guess will give you a lot of clarity when it comes to analyzing market inventory levels was one of them. The price segmentation. He talked about, I guess, a bit about his history as well. Talking about, I guess, the current markets and as well looking at, I guess, owner outright um, values and, of course, the percentage of tenants, of, of how many tenants in a, in a particular market, what to look out for. So it's really important to understand these things because, like I always touch on, Adrian and I, you know, 99.6 Australian of Australian investors don't own more than three investment properties. So if you want to, if you want to own three or more, which is a 0.4% ratio, you have to do things a little bit different. And, and data is one of them. So data is one of those, you know, bits and pieces. So we talked about a data. We talked as well. Infrastructure project has a lot to do with, you know, the big pieces as well, so which, which Ken is an advocate for as well. So it, it was a great, it was a great session. Go back, listen you know, you'll get more value once you listen to it twice. Share it with a friend if you know someone that's about to buy an investment property or loves data or loves property investing, and maybe they don't want to invest now, but then in the future, listening to this will help them make a good informed decision. If you like today's podcast, then you're absolutely going to love the Investing You Facebook group, where we share a bunch of valuable tips and tricks on property investing for our exclusive community. Come join us and let's level up.